we received Megan's diagnosis probably about nine months of age. They told us it was a very serious disease. They told us it was a fatal disease. And we got the call a couple of days afterwards that Patrick, who was only seven days old, also had Pompeii disease. So within the span of those first couple of months, we learned we had two kids who probably wouldn't live to be two. Pompeii is a rare genetic disease. The kids, because of their genetic defect, they can't break down sugar. If you were diagnosed with Pompeii disease, absent a treatment, you will die from your disease. Megan got profoundly sick. She had to go on a ventilator. She was in the hospital for six weeks. Her heart stopped three times in those six weeks. But she's a tough little kid. I remember looking at Megan and, and into those big brown eyes of hers, and she was scanning the room, and she kind of locked on to, to me, and then she locked on to Eileen. And, uh, you know, I think those little eyes, you know, they, they told us a lot. And I think they told us that she didn't want to quit, that she wanted to fight. And I think from that moment on, we both knew she wanted to fight so we would too. We grew increasingly frustrated with the pace of research, with always seeming like we were out of the loop, and eventually, out of desperation, Eileen and I decided that we'd try to help take the lead in the, the quest for a treatment or cure. And I went in the next day and told my boss that I'm gonna step away from a secure job, and you know the, the pay and the stability for us, the health insurance, all of that, and take a chance on starting a business. I had a lot of confidence in John, and I knew that if he was comfortable and had done the research and had done the homework and knew he could do this, I just needed to give him my full support. I had very, very limited experience uh, in the medical world, and there were tough times. There were times where we were frustrated, times where the kids were so very sick, and times we just wanted to let nature take its course. But eventually, we saw some very positive signs, and that was just so amazingly exciting. Then, of course, you start to think, okay, how can I quickly get Megan and Patrick on it? Because I was an executive of the company developing the drug, hospital review boards were not comfortable with my kids being in a clinical study, so I made it easy for them. I quit my job. I remember the day the kids were first infused. I got to press the infusion button to start Megan's infusion. Eileen got to press Patrick's. We hadn't seen her smile in, in two years. After the first couple of months, we started to notice that she was smiling again. So that was the first sign to me that there's some hope. And then we went for the 12-week review. And I remember telling Megan, this means, Megan, that your heart's getting better. And it means you're gonna live to be an old, an old lady. And then um, she looked at me and kind of gave me a thumbs up and just threw her arm around me and, and said thank you. So that's the house on the left, Megan, right there. That green one with the tents around it. Hey guys, this one. Just want to introduce our real Megan and Patrick and John Jr. that are here today. John is a remarkable person. It's the power of his love for his kids to overcome extraordinary, difficult circumstances. John's the kind of guy who says no, no is not acceptable. I'm gonna find a way to turn no into a maybe and then maybe into yes. People always say, how do you do it? I'm like, how do you do it? How do you not? I think most people in this position would do what they could to make their kids happy. I think I did my job. As a dad, I did what I had to do. And I don't think that makes you a hero. Ladies and gentlemen, John Crowley. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, Dean. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, Jim has not yet passed me a note, but if he does, I'll let you know. And I hope it does say, please drink your wine. Um, it has been uh, 12 years since our kid was were diagnosed with that Pompeii disease, and we thought we'd show the video to give you a little bit of perspective on life, because what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about tonight is about entrepreneurship, 
what I think it means, and the characteristics of an entrepreneur that have helped us, not just in business, but in life over the last 12 years. The, the title of the movie was one that they, uh, they spent a lot of time on. They didn't come up with it until about two months before the marketing all started. They did all the focus groups. They came up with some pretty neat titles. Um, uh, so determined, so defiant. I think a lot of titles that would fit any entrepreneur in any measure of society. But eventually they settled on, and they do, you know, again, all these focus groups and research. And eventually they settled on extraordinary measures. And I think it's apt because when I think of extraordinary measures and I think about, yes, what we did in starting a business devoted to, to curing a disease, but then also how we've tried to live our life every day, I think it is a testament to so many people along the way who have helped us try to live a better, a longer life and to try to be better people. We've been on a lot of TV shows over the last couple of months talking about the film and our life and what it means and what's next for the rare disease world, what's next for our family. When I get asked the question of what's Extraordinary Measures really about, there are a lot of adjectives that could describe it. It's about family, it's about faith, it's about science, perseverance, all those things, so many things that do characterize entrepreneurs. But in one of those in interviews, I actually said that Extraordinary Measures, to me, more than anything, is about mm -hmm. entrepreneurship. And I think about all that happened and all the setbacks, all the successes, and in biotech, for those of you who work in our industry, I don't know that it's any different from any other high-tech industry or any other low-tech industry, where it's two steps forward, one step back every day, and sometimes you get that backwards. But I do think the characteristics of being an entrepreneur are really the greatest strategic advantage you can have in being a leader, a leader in life, a leader in business. The press around the movie is just dying down now. It was introduced, the, the film here in January and February. The international releases start at the end of February. The movie opened in Italy last Friday, and I didn't have the good fortune to go to Italy, but I did an interview by phone with a newspaper in Milan, Corriere della Sera. And it was a beautiful interview, wonderful lady, and she asked me a question. She said, could this have happened in Italy? And I answered her, and I'm half Italian, so I wanted to be careful, but also uh, brutally honest. I said, no, I don't think so. In fact, I don't think it could have happened anywhere else in the world except here in America. Because what we did took private companies, public companies, it took academic researchers, took researchers in government, it took the federal bureaucracy that approves these drugs that was actually quite willing to help and quite compassionate. It took philanthropists, it took patient organizations, it took families, all of it together in what I think was a very uniquely American way to solve a problem. And that's how do you fix a human genetic disease? How do you not only beat nature, but how do you beat time? I read somewhere once that what entrepreneurs really do is renew society by looking to make products, institutions, and practices better. We are the force of creative destruction while simultaneously creating new ideas, opportunities, and business models. I think that's an apt description. I was at Princeton about a week ago and a professor there, Ed Zhao, who's a wonderful entrepreneur, who's been teaching kids for 15 years, seniors at Princeton in entrepreneurship. He asked me to come in and lecture and I'd never lectured at Princeton, so I was happy to do it. And I talked for about 80 minutes and I promise you, I'll only be about 20 tonight. He, uh, he asked me to come in and talk about our very personal experiences in biotech and the lessons learned in life, some of which we, we wrote about in our, our memoir, Chasing Miracles, and I did that. And I shared with him all those perspectives, and I'll, I'll share some of them with you tonight as well, because they are characterized in part by the traits that make a great entrepreneur. And I think they got it, and I, I kind of hoped so, and they were nodding, and I said, it's an incredibly smart group of kids. And the next day, the professor sent me a really nice note, and he said, uh, it was two days later, he said, you know, Johnny said, you were the last lecturer to come in, and I just delivered the year-end address that I give to the kids about what it's all about. And I asked him, I said, what is entrepreneurial, 
relationship all about. He said, what I tell the kids is it's not what it's about because it's about a lot of things, that you could be an entrepreneur in every measure of your life, that yes, it is in part a state of mind, it's a state of being, it's looking differently at problems in life. He said, it's every adjective you can envision. He said, what's it not about? And his answer to those kids a couple of days ago, the same answer he's given for the last 15 years in that lecture, is it's not about the money. It's about making a difference in life. It's about chasing dreams. That capitalism and entrepreneurship aren't about greed. You could be the greediest person in the world, but if you don't know how to compete and you don't know how to innovate, you're never gonna make a dime. And likewise, you can care less about money, but if you make great products and you service your customers, you follow the duty to obsolete your own technologies, you stay ahead of the curve, before you know it, the wealth will come. What you do with it is your own choice. He said it's about something bigger than you. And I think that characterizes pretty well an incredible trait for an entrepreneur is realizing that perspective that it is bigger than you, however you define it. What I'd like to do is to share with you my view on five traits that make a great entrepreneur. And I hope by giving some examples of people who I've seen who have taught me in life, some of whom I never even met, hopefully to give a little bit deeper perspective to what entrepreneurship is really about. First is vision. When we started that first company, it was Novozyme Pharmaceuticals. It was based on work that a researcher at the University of Oklahoma had done. We started it with three of us with $37,000 in seed capital and a small little lab in Oklahoma. And we lived down in Princeton and I, with our kids, I could never move. So I would commute every Monday out to Oklahoma City and then back on Friday. And the first thing we did wasn't go through all the data or go through the plans or build spreadsheets. We sat in a room, the three or four of us, and we talked about where do we want to be five years, 10 years from then. For us, the answer was easy. We wanted to first cure Pompeii disease, then come up with technologies to treat a range of human genetic disorders, and then who knows where from there. There are some amazing people who have worked in the biotechnology industry over the years. It's an industry that this month is just 34 years old. And it goes back to people who shared an incredible vision. And let me tell you the story of the very first biotechnology company. Back in uh, April of 1976, there was a researcher who had been doing work about DNA technologies and recombinant proteins and this idea of human genetic engineering to make medicines and extend and enhance people's lives. And he caught the attention of a young venture capitalist. The scientist was a guy named Herb Boyer, the venture capitalist who was at uh, Kleiner Perkins out in Palo Alto, was uh, Bob Swanson. Bob kept pressing the professor because he thought maybe there was a business here. Maybe there was a way to take those technologies and really accelerate them into clinical studies, a way to build something great. He had, a, he had this vision just based on papers he had read and academic conferences he had attended. So we bugged this uh, Dr. Boyer and finally the doctor said, okay, I'll give you 10 minutes. He said, come and meet me. And the meeting started in the offices. Before you know it, they started to capture each other's attention. It moved, all, like all good meetings do, it moved to a bar. It expanded to a three-hour meeting. And literally on a cocktail napkin, they came up with the idea for what would become the largest biotechnology company in the world, a company called Genentech, founded in 1976. And like a lot of companies, it you know, had its ups, it had its downs, it went public in, I think, 1980, 1982, their first drug got approved. The company went on and, you know, again, steps forward, steps back. Fast forward to 1999, Bob Swanson, that venture capitalist who had the vision for what would become Genentech, he died of brain cancer for all the wonderful medicines, particularly in the oncology area that Genentech was able to make. They weren't able to make one to treat Herb's brain cancer, but still part of his legacy and part of his vision and dream lived on in what became the great science and the great products at Genentech. And sometimes that vision is also married with the vision of other great entre entrepreneurs and people. 
There was a doctor, Dr. Judah Falkman, and he worked up in Boston for a long, long time, and he was a cancer researcher. Back in the 70s, he didn't know anything about Herb or Bob or the guys at Genentech, but in the 70s into the 80s, he had an idea. An idea that you can actually treat cancer, solid tumors in particular, by starving them of the blood supply. Wonderful idea, met with great fanfare. Companies formed around it. Billions of dollars eventually in the 80s and 90s went into it. Many, many clinical studies in this field of what they called anti-angiogenesis, starving those cancer tumors of the blood supply. And one by one, every one of those clinical studies failed. Until in 2004, Genentech, which had licensed partial rights to it, announced at a cancer meeting that when used in combination with a chemotherapy in colorectal cancer, it showed a significant benefit in extending and enhancing people's lives. For years and years, Dr. Falkman lived through the excitement of the technology he had developed. He also lived through years and years of failure, some really tough accusations of whether his work was even real, and people just began to be frustrated. But to see the vision of those guys who put together Genentech come together, and to see it married with a great entrepreneur like Dr. Falkman, who himself passed away a couple of years ago. If you ever want to learn more about it, there's a wonderful book, Dr. Falkman's War, about his battles. Dr. Falkman would probably never describe himself as an entrepreneur, but you think about what he did in setting a vision, what he did in challenging paradigms that existed, in raising money, in dealing with setbacks. I think that's the true mark of an entrepreneur and one who had incredible vision in what he did. The second trait that we relied on a great deal over the last 10 or 12 years has been persistence. When I started the first day at Novozyme, I, I, I didn't have anything in my office. I, I think I had a little picture of the kids. I had a little plaque, though, my mom had sent me with a nice little note, and the, and the plaque was really just a bookmark, and it was a quote from Winston Churchill. And it said, never, never, never quit. And as was alluded to in that video, there were many times where I did want to quit. I didn't want to be away from the kids. I couldn't raise the money. I couldn't pay the company bills. I couldn't pay our bills. I didn't think I was the smartest guy to do this. A whole host of reasons why it made sense, sometimes pretty rationally, to give up. To give up on what we were building, to give up on our hope and our dream. And sometimes that tiny little plaque made all the difference in the world, thinking about it, going home on a Thursday night and seeing the kids in bed, and knowing, I think, what they needed me and our team to do. That was an incredible amount of motivation, but even still, constantly thinking about never, never, never quit, and what it means to really persist in the face of failure, and also to welcome failure, to realize that failure is going to be inevitable. If you sign up to be an entrepreneur, I promise you, you are going to fail. Don't feel that you've done something wrong when you do. All you have to do is learn from it, move on, take the lessons, and just keep building something great. One of my other favorite researchers in the biotech world, arguably the first biotech researcher, was Dr. Jonas Salk. Many of you may know him because he invented the vaccine for polio, but here's a guy who never, never, never quit. His original work in uh, 19, the late 1940s at the University of Pittsburgh was actually funded by a grant from the National Infantile Paralysis Association, and it wasn't to develop a vaccine. It was to do some epidemiologic work to characterize just how many people had these different forms of polio. But again, he had the vision, but he also had the persistence in the face of people in his university telling him, no, you can't do that, you can't go off into research, people who gave him his grant telling him no, people in his own lab, in the face of failure after failure in developing that vaccine, he continued to persist. And if any of you were alive then, or your parents or grandparents, you know back in the early 1950s, polio was the great you know, health scourge of our society. Apart from the atomic bomb, it was probably the greatest fear that people lived with. And here was a guy who had a vision to develop this vaccine, who persisted, who never took no for an answer, who tested the drug on himself, you talk about a risk taker, who when he put it together, put it in a clinical study 
inside of a year and a half, tested in 1.8 million school children. Good luck getting that clinical study approved today. <laughs> and finally, in 1954, that drug was approved and polio began its journey to be eradicated from the face of the earth. And as a footnote, he also donated the patent to the public domain. He never took any profits from his vaccine. He's a man who, and if you ever read more about him, you realize so many different times in so many different ways, he persisted and he never, never, never quit. The third characteristic that I think is essential for any entrepreneur is optimism. Not only is the glass half full, it's also pretty clean too. I've learned a lot. Eileen and I, my wife and I have learned a lot from a lot of people. I think more than anyone through the last 12 years though, we've learned from our children. And we've learned more about life and love and learning and living than we've ever taught them without them ever knowing that we're teaching them along the way. My daughter has this incredible spirit about her. Every morning when I'm in there cleaning up and shaving and getting ready for work and her house is crazy, she comes barreling in in her wheelchair and asks me, how was your night, Dad? How'd you sleep? Where are you going today? What are you doing? All the questions that a little girl is supposed to ask her dad when he's getting ready in the morning. And I ask her, Megs, how are you doing? And every morning for years now, she's given me the exact same answer. And here's a little kid who's been through an enormous amount of challenge in her life who still needs a ventilator to breathe and a wheelchair to get around, even though thankfully with the medicine we developed, she may live hopefully many, many more decades and continue to get stronger. She gives me a one word answer every morning. When I say, Megs, how are you doing? She says, awesome. I am awesome. And I think for most people, if you didn't know Megan and you hadn't met her, that probably wouldn't be the adjective you'd pick to think about how this little girl would describe who she is or how she is that morning. But that's her optimism and it's not forced, it's genuine. Because she's taught us again so much about the life that we live. Part of being an optimist means never ever feeling sorry for yourself. And boy, there are times I think anybody who's struggled, whether you're building a great university with that entrepreneur mindset, whether you're building a business, whether you're a political entrepreneur, whatever it may be, it's easy to feel sorry for yourself. We, uh, another quick lesson from Megan, we, as the kids have been doing better and better on their medicine, and now that they're living so much longer than kids ever lived with that awful disease, we now have a whole new series of health challenges, and we've got to figure out newer and better ways to deal with that. One of which is because the kids have never walked, uh, their bones aren't as strong as they need to be. So about a year ago, we started to think, well, how can we make their bones stronger? We looked at a couple of different options. We actually decided to give them a drug called Reclast, a drug usually given for people, older people with severe osteoporosis. The doc said, no, it's, it's never really been given to kids, but I think it'll be safe. But just to be sure, let's administer it to Megan and Patrick in a hospital setting. In fact, would you mind taking them to Columbia Presbyterian in New York? There's some experts there with the medicine. I'd really like them to be in that environment, our doctor told us. We said, fine. He said also, too, since they're infused with the infusion ports in their chest, um, would, you, uh, would you mind doing it in the pediatric oncology unit? And I said, no, doc, wherever you think is best, we'll, we'll go. So we did that. If you ever need perspective in life, go to a pediatric oncology unit. So we come in, and it's a one day, it's only a half hour infusion, and as we're coming in, they have a, a little bed on the side for Megan, a little one for Patrick. It's a huge room, and there's about 10 or 15 kids getting their oncology infusions. And we kind of swing past them and we come in with our nurses and our, you know, we call it the Crowley Fun Machine. We come in with a lot of people and we get the kids settled. And I was worried about my son, Patrick, because sometimes in new settings, he's a little, a little scared and he's a little quieter than his incredibly precocious and outgoing sister. So I spent time with Patrick. We get him settled and I, uh, all of a sudden I, li I listen and I look over and I see Megan's crying. And this is a kid who never cries, never feels sorry for herself. So I figure something must be wrong. So I go over, I said, Megs, Megs, honey, what's the matter? And she said to me, she said, Daddy, it hurt. they were trying to access her with the, the needle into her chest and they just couldn't get it the way the port was sitting. And they had stuck her three times already in the chest. So, you know, as a dad, your heart just breaks and she's got tears coming down her face. And I said, 
sweetie, honey, it's going to be okay, but it's really important you get this medicine. And, you know, she says, please, daddy, please, you know, if there's any way, I, I, please, I don't want to do this. I want to go home. And I said, honey, please, just one more try. Please, just one more try. So she kind of took a deep breath in, and they stuck her, and they got it. Thank goodness they got her. And they taped it up, and they started the infusion, and things were kind of quiet. And you know, she was 12 years old at the time, a year ago, and she's kind of settled down. And I was standing there next to her, her doc, who's a, a longtime friend of ours now, Dr. Slonim. And uh, Megan starts looking around the room, and she notices the other kids. And she kind of watches them for a while, and then she looks back at me and looks back at Dr. Slonim. And she says, Dad, she says, come here. She says, look at those kids over there. Yeah, Megs, now here's a little girl hooked up to a ventilator laying in bed or just went through all of this. And she said, she said, I think they all have cancer. I said, yeah, Megs, they do. It's a tough break. And this little kid in her empathy, Megan kind of puts her hand on her chest and she says, ah, oh. She said, I feel so badly for those kids. And then she proceeded to try to negotiate a shopping trip downtown into New York. She goes down the list. She figures, well, I got them good now. So I'm standing there, but I'm standing next to the doc, who's this wonderful person, Dr. Slonim, who you know, was an Israeli paratrooper, and he's seen a lot in his life. He's you know, into his 70s, and he's standing there, and he's got a little tear in his eye, and he's still just looking down at Megan. And he just says, remarkable, just remarkable. And neither he and I ever talked about that moment again, but for me it was an incredibly important lesson in life. It was a lesson about not feeling sorry for yourselves, because if there was ever anyone who had an excuse to sometimes feel sorry for herself, it's my little, now 13-year-old daughter, Megan. And she doesn't. She thinks she's awesome. And what a great lesson for us, and what a great lesson for our entrepreneurs, and never feeling sorry for yourself, and a lesson in always being optimistic. Another lesson for us, too, the greatest entrepreneurs I have ever met are humble. They've met with amazing success in their life, many times after enduring incredible failure. But they're humble. Sometimes it's hard for us. Sometimes you really do great things, and everybody's telling you you're wonderful. The company I run today, Amicus, we, uh, we came to about five years ago because we thought there was something special in the technologies, a way to obsolete the old way of thinking and to think about a new way of treating human genetic disorders. And we built and continue to build the company. But those first three years were kind of a magical, exciting time. And it culminated in one respect for us in an IPO. And you know, as an entrepreneur, that's at least it used to be, the, the three letters that really mark success were the IPO. And we went through that. We had the bake-off, and every bank wanted to be a part of the deal, and they all tell you you're terrific. Then you go out on the road show, and uh, I know it may be hard to remember a time when IPO road shows were big deals, but back in the spring of 2007, it was that time, and we were one of those companies. And they take you around, and the rooms are filled, and everybody's vying to get a piece of the deal, and they put you on the Gulfstream airplane, and after two weeks on the road, you know, our book, I think, was seven or eight times oversubscribed. And all of a sudden, they put a $300 million valuation on our company. We raised $75 million in capital. We finish it in New York with a board meeting approving the deal. I take the whole company in that next morning. We open, watch the trading on the, the, the Morgan Stanley desk. That afternoon, we have a great lunch. Then we all go down to NASDAQ. It's a wonderful event, and there's balloons, and we just created 12 millionaires in my company. And we also had a lot of capital to advance all the programs we, we cared an enormous amount about. So you feel pretty good about yourself. And I, you know, you're on CNBC, and you're closing the stock exchange. And when you go public, you actually sign this Lucite marker, and they put it at the same time. Up, uh, up in Times Square with your company logo and your picture. Then they march you out to Times Square to take a picture of your executive team. It's a pretty neat deal. So I go home that night. A lot of the folks stayed in and had a nice time in New York that night, but I was tired. I've been on the road for two weeks. So my wife and I go back home, and I, I come in. And I say goodnight to John and Patrick, and they're sleeping. Give them a little kiss. And I come into Megan's room, and I give her a kiss, and she's a light sleeper, and... She kind of looks at me and she goes, Daddy, Daddy, I waited up for you. I said, oh, Mags, I said, 
so good to see you. She said, Daddy, I missed you so much. I said, I missed you too. She said, uh, I saw you on TV today. At this point, thinking, you know what? I think we did pretty well these last couple of weeks. So I looked at her, I said, well, Megan, I said, it was a big couple of weeks for our company and our family. I said, uh, I think Daddy did pretty well this week. I said, uh, what do you think? She goes, oh, I was so excited, Daddy. I, when I saw you on TV, I said, oh, yeah. I said, well, how'd I look on TV? She goes, well, you looked really, 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 and I'm thinking, powerful, pick the adjective. She goes, really short. <laughs> And kind of, it's just me and her in the room, it's late at night, and I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, you know what, uh, that big Gulf Stream playing, all that stuff, really doesn't matter all that much. And, and Megan's also the master at how to damn with faint praise, and so she says, oh, but boy, I love, love your tie. So, okay. so a little lesson in humility, but also, too, I think a lesson in realizing what it's all about, and maybe that's what humility is that grounding, that sense of what it is all about. Whatever is the most important thing to you, for many of us, it is our families. Whether it's your God, your business, your family, or all the above, to realize that as quickly as success comes, but by the grace of God, it could be gone the next day. And I realized that night, standing next to Megan's bed, you know what, she wasn't very impressed with our IPO. And she wasn't impressed with big Gulfstream planes, and she didn't even really care who Merrill Lynch or Morgan Stanley were. What she really cared about was having her dad at home. And she missed him after those two weeks. And she thought about things like going to school the next day, about going to a friend's birthday party that weekend. And that's what it's all really about, part of that humility. And the final thought I'll leave you with is about time itself. Maybe because we live with kids where life is maybe a little extra special each day, maybe a little bit more precious. Maybe we've come to realize a different perspective of time and what it all means. I read a, a neat little book a couple of years ago by Anna Quinlan. It's called a, Sh uh, a Short Guide to a Happy Life. And in that book, Anna says that uh, life is a terminal illness. We're all going to die from it. And the measure of your life is how you live those days in between and the time that you spend. It's a great lesson. As entrepreneurs, we work really, really hard. And hard work is the price of success often. But you need to find that balance in life, too. It's something I continue to struggle with. It's something I tried to instill in those kids in Princeton last week. It's something I try to instill in my friends and the people I work with still something I try to balance every day. The, uh, the woman, Gita Anand, the Wall Street Journal reporter, wonderful lady who spent a lot of time with our family, who wrote the articles and then the book that inspired Extraordinary Measures, she uh, became good friends with our family. And her kids became good friends with our kids. And we keep in close touch today. She's moved back, actually, from New York to Mumbai. But I think Gita, in her book, in talking about time, put it in perspective in, in, in ways far more eloquent than I ever could. So if you'll allow me, I'll close my thoughts tonight as we think about entrepreneurship, the wonderful things that entrepreneurs have done to change society, to change the world. I'll close with reading you the last paragraph of the epilogue of Gita's book, The Cure, and what we've learned about what it all really means and putting it in perspective when it comes to time in our lives. Gita wrote that, as human beings, we are defined at our cores by how we respond to hardship. Writing about the Crowleys has taught me that there is not one right way, but that each person must find her own path, drawing on her own strength, passion, and resources. Who can say whether John or Eileen's role is more important? Fueled by love, each of their journeys is tough, vital, and courageous. Knowing that each day really may be their children's last, they live with abandon, throwing themselves into every birthday party, trip to Broadway, weekend in Ocean City. Knowing so intimately the tenuousness of life, they instinctively understand what most of us sometimes forget, that all they really have and all they really are pursuing is time. 
time with the people they love. And so they grab onto each precious moment, cherish it, celebrate it, laugh at it, cry in it, and hope for another, even as they continue on the journey into the unknown and unknowable that we call life. Thank you. Good luck. That was, I'm speechless. Usually I'm not speechless, but uh, I don't know how to follow that. Uh, the only thing I'll say is I think we made the right choice, the right person that embodies innovation and entrepreneurship and is from our Garden State, is here with us tonight. So thank you again, uh, John, for being here, spending your precious time with us. John will stay with us just a bit longer. He brought some books, uh, so he'll be back in the entranceway for those folks who want to uh, grab a book. Um, again, we are delighted to have you. We thank you for being here. Uh, that really encapsulates everything uh, that we are all about. We have accomplished a great deal since 1989, and some of the highlights are in your program. You should know that multiple volumes would be necessary to tell the whole story. It is a story about thousands of people we've helped over the years, the students, entrepreneurs, business owners, family firm members, and working professionals and executives who each have their own story about the role we've played in their success. And they, in essence, are part of our extended family. I'd like to thank our exceptional staff and brilliant faculty for without their impressive efforts over the years, we would not be able to celebrate here tonight. And naturally, we could not be here today if it was not for our founding and former directors who created the foundation from which we have flourished. Bernie Tenenbaum launched the Institute 20 years ago and won many battles to make it a reality. And thanks to his successor, Leo Rogers, my mentor who retired seven years ago, but continues, he continues to work with us with the, with the family businesses that are part of the forum. And lastly, once again, we cannot um, forget to thank George Rothman, who made this center possible. We are also thankful for the continued and strong support of the College of Business and to the university. And thanks to his successor, Leo Rogers, my mentor who retired seven years ago, but continues He continues to work with us with the, with the family businesses that are part of the forum.